Sweet. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. All right, he is risen. All right, yeah, yeah, okay, right, this is what I love about K2, is many of us didn't grow up in church. Isn't that good? It's a beautiful thing, and, uh, but partly th throughout the history of the church, there's been this statement where the guy would get up and he'd say, he is risen, and then everybody in the congregation would yell back, he is risen indeed. Okay, I'm glad you didn't know that. It, uh, that's cool. So, but let's try that, okay? I'm going to go, he is risen. You guys yell back, he is risen indeed. Okay, here we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Awesome. Very cool. Hey, well, here's the deal. Um, we are like sardines in this service right here, okay? So here's what I need. Uh, we got some people jam You Everybody turn right, wave at everybody back in the, in the doorway, okay? So here's what we need to do. I need you literally just to stand up real quick and move into the center and make sure there are no empty seats within the center so that people can come in. Uh, no, I said everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. All right, there we go. And then uh, move toward the center of your aisle. Say hi to everybody while you're doing it. Go ahead and give a warm welcome to everybody. Give a greeting and then uh, move towards the center. All right. If I could have the house lights up just a little bit more, I need to see these beautiful people. That'd be awesome. Oh, you guys. Um, there is no greater uh, day in all of human history. And I don't know for sure. Uh, you know, what's, what's cool is I, I'm not sure what you even believe about Christ. But there's one thing you got to believe about him, and that is that just by his presence, this, uh, hey. <laughs> that this day in history changed the world. Whether, well, I don't, it doesn't even matter what you believe about Jesus, whether he's the son of God or he was just some dude. One thing you know is that after his resurrection from the dead, history changed. Everything changed. But I just want to tell you, now here's what we're going to talk about today. If he is alive, if he actually rose from the dead and is living today, then not only did he change everything 2,000 years ago, he changes everything right now. Right now. Now, and that's really good news. You guys, is that he changes stuff. How many of you want to change in your life? Anybody? Okay, awesome. This is so cool. In fact, you know, so we look at this and we realize that when Mary... What came to this tomb, this, this thing that we were looking for, she was looking for uh, Jesus. But what kind of Jesus was she looking for? Yeah, she's looking for a dead one. And uh, so let's pick up the story here and see what happened. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go on a, uh, to anoint Jesus' body. And very early on in the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw this, that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he said, don't be alarmed. He goes, in other words, what he says is, don't freak out. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. In other words, what he's saying is, you're looking for Jesus the, the, the guy who lived in Nazareth. You're looking for, for Dave from Lapeer. He goes, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He goes, you're looking for just this guy that died. And then he said, he is risen. And then I love this phrase. These are my three favorite words this whole verse. He is not here. Isn't that awesome? He's not here. You're looking for dead Jesus, the Nazarene. And that dead Jesus isn't here anymore. So go, tell the disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of them into Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. So you guys, my question for you today is, is what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Now, everybody said that there's one change, and so here's Mary, and she's looking for this dead Jesus, and, 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 and she doesn't find him. But, but just out, out of curiosity, what, what are you, some, some of you guys are saying, man, I'm looking for a change. What are some things that you want to find? What are you looking for? 
peace, happiness. What's that? A job. Awesome. What else are you looking for? Money. What else are you looking for? A yeah, clean house. Sweet. Hey, you know, we're going to get to that in just a minute. Dude, you set me up well. That's awesome. Seriously, what are you looking for? Love? What's that? God's love? Is that what you said? What, what's so different about God's love? It's awesome. It's real. What's that? It's real. Unconditional. It's perfect. See, it's so cool because this agape love, this Greek word that he used to help us understand what love is, it's the love literally that doesn't depend on anything about who you are. Agape love, the love of God says, you know what? I love you no matter what. You're totally screwed up, aren't you? So am I. And God looks at us and he says, you know what? In all of your junk, all of your sin, all of your brokenness, all of your wounds, all of your shame, you know, everything that, no, that you don't do when you come to church, right? Because when you come to church, you got to put on your happy face, right? Because I'm here with judgmental people and everybody else has got their act together but me. So let me just pretend I'm okay. And the cool thing is, you guys, is God looks right through your mask. Uh, there was this great book I read. It's called Abba's Child. And it talked about how every single one of us has an imposter, he called it. And the imposter is the person that we put on because we think that's the person that will be loved. You guys know, you know what that's like, right? You go, if I act like this, then I'll get back what I want. He said the real problem with that, though, is that all of us have this problem. Is so you put on the person that you think will be accepted and loved, and then that person gets loved. And you know the problem with that? Is then you know that the real person isn't loved and you're scared to death to ever actually be who you are because you got to keep playing the game. And how cool would it be to experience a love from God who says, man, I know everything about you. Because I'm telling you, it's great to be loved by another human being. It really is. But I'm telling you, it's something completely different when you actually get loved by the one who knows everything about you. It's very cool. Anybody else? Seriously, like deeply, what do you want? What are you looking for? Freedom? Freedom is a big one for me. Yeah. What's that? Salvation. Salvation. Joy. joy. Anybody want some joy? Sweet. <laughs> Baby, good luck. You're in church. You can have that in about an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. So here's the deal. So Mary goes, and she looks for a dead Jesus. And praise God, she didn't find one, right? But, and here's the deal. So then Mary goes, and it says later on in the passage that she wanted other people to know. Once she actually ran into him and found out he wasn't dead, then she wanted everybody to know. And so in verse 9, it says, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, what was their response? You liar. They didn't believe her. And then it says, the very next verse, and then afterward, Jesus appeared to a different form, in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. And so they returned and they responded to the rest. And they reported it to the rest, excuse me. But how did those guys respond? Yeah, they didn't believe it either. Now, now, can I just ask you, seriously, would you have believed it? No way. There's no way. In fact, I got to tell you, it, as, the, as the scripture said, Mary shows up and everybody, all the guys are mourning and they're weeping. If Mary, if I'm, a, if I'm one of those guys and I'm mourning and weeping because I gave my life to this guy, I believed he was the Messiah. I believed he was going to be the ruler. He poured into me for three years, and he was going to be the one to set us free from Roman control. I, he was the man. And then he dies. I'm like, I'm mourning and I'm weeping. And then Mary hops through the door and says, he's alive. I would be, I, seriously, I thought about this. I'd be angry. 
I, my response would have been, shut up. <laughs> Don't mess with me. I mean, seriously, my heart is aching enough to have you be screwing around with some Jesus is alive crap. It's not true. I saw him die. I saw him put the spear in the side and the water and the blood float out. How many of you have ever seen a dead person? How many of you have seen a dead person? Man, I'll never forget. I saw my mom dead right after I saw her. When, when a person's dead, you know, you know what they are? They're dead. They're not there. And these disciples knew that. And then Mary comes through the door and says, no, he's alive. See, now, now, now let me ask you this. So even though Mary couldn't really grasp it initially, and then all the disciples, when they came and told him that Jesus was alive and they couldn't grasp it, do you really think that Mary wanted a dead Jesus though? I mean, did she want a savior who was still going to be wrapped up in linen cloth and laid in the tomb? No. That was just her reality. How could she expect anything more? When someone dies, they're, they're gone. That's the end. See, Mary didn't want a dead Jesus, but she had no idea that she could have a living one. And here's what I want to throw out to you today. If this is a normal K2 service, 25% of you at least in this room are still at a place where you're just trying to, you're checking this thing out. You're wondering about Christ and you, and you don't believe in him yet. And I, can I just say, I thank you so much for being here. You know, thanks for honoring your friend or family member, whoever got you to come this morning. And, and I, but personally, as a, as a pastor here, and by the way, my name's Dave, if you're new. And I'm the pastor here. And I just want to say to you, thank you for coming and honoring us by giving up some time to consider the fact that Jesus Christ might be a risen Savior and Lord over all the world. It's just, it's an amazing thought. And, and here's what I want to tell you. See, I don't think that there's any person who literally wants there to be just this life where, where just my own humanity is enough. I think that almost every person is longing for something greater, to believe that there maybe is something supernatural, to believe that maybe there is something beyond me, to believe that, and I just sit there and I think, do you want more? Do you want more than what we could have? And, and here's what I want to ask you. Would you just today potentially just open up to the possibility, like, because I know we all have, we all have our own kind of opinions and we all only have our own preconceived judgments about what took place 2,000 years ago. But would you be willing today just to imagine, imagine what if Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead? And that he didn't just want to change human history 2,000 years ago. He wants to change you today. Because I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but if there's a supernatural power that's beyond myself, that's loving and good and powerful and right, that I could experience in my life, I want to know it. So I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to pray and ask God right now, because I've been thinking about this day all morning long. I'm sitting there, okay, Jesus, we're going to celebrate the fact that we're, you're alive today. And all I want to pray is, would you show up and be alive right here, right now? <laughs> show up and be alive right here, right now. And so as I pray, open up your own heart and say, okay, God, if you got anything for me, bring it on. And let's go for it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you love Jesus Christ, that you sent him into this world. Thank you that you love us enough so that we could have the life that you've really created us to have. And Lord, I, I just want to ask right now that you might, because there's not a person sitting in this room and you know their heart, you know everything about them, you know where they stand with you, what they think about you, and you love them. Every one of us, you love me, every heart in this room. And Jesus, if you're alive, 
And if there's a life to be lived that's more powerful than we've ever dreamed, if we could have an experience today like Mary had walking into the tomb, expecting to run into a dead Jesus and instead to have her whole life turned around, I just pray that you might come in here now and turn our lives around. And I ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys. So because here's what's interesting. is um, So even though when, when Mary didn't believe it and the disciples didn't believe it, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and this is an amazing passage, Paul, <clears throat> who, uh, who wrote uh, as much of the New Testament for us, he, he wanted as well to sit there and say, he just said, I want you guys to know. He goes, I want you to understand. And he starts off with verse three and he says, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. <laughs> I, just, I just read that over in the red box for the second service. And I just realized, you know, for me today, on this day, literally what I, all I want to do, you guys too, is I want to pass on to you what I've received. And um, obviously, I give my life to this, but there's only one reason I give my life to this, and that is because I cannot deny the reality of God that penetrated into my life without me even looking for it. And so Paul goes on, he goes, I want to, pa- receive, I want to pass on to you what I received as a first important, and here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and here he goes, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12, and then after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. See, in other words, he's saying that'd be a church like this. So in other words, you guys, it'd like be, we'd be all gathered together, and then Jesus Christ shows up. And then he goes on, he goes, and then he appeared to James, and then he appeared to all the apostles, and then last of all, he appeared to me. See, so it's one thing if some woman comes running to you and says, hey, the dude you just saw die is alive. And then you go, no, 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 no. Shut up, you're messing with me. But what do you do with a Jesus who shows up to 500 people at the same time? What do you do with a Jesus who keeps appearing after he was dead? See, this is the Jesus that we celebrate, the one who literally is alive. And then, you guys, what that brought to all of them was hope. See, then they were finally able to go, awesome. So, so you, all that stuff you just taught us for three years, it wasn't just a bunch of hogwash. We actually should really believe this. The fact that the kingdom of God is at hand and the power of heaven is right now for us to experience. See, now they had hope for he's alive. So the question is, well, what does that mean? Why is Jesus alive? And here's the whole key to the day. Here's the whole key to life. It's the key to Easter. Jesus Christ is alive to live in you. Jesus Christ is alive to live in you. In Colossians chapter 1, it says there was a mystery that had been hidden for ages and ages. And then it finally got disclosed in Christ to everybody. And you know what the mystery was? The hope of glory is Christ in you. See, you guys, this is where when I think of how many people will say that Christianity isn't a very spiritual religion, you know, if you're really spiritual, then you do Buddhism or you do Hinduism or you're, you get into the stuff that's actually spiritual. And this is where I just want to go, are you kidding me? How much more spiritual does it get that a man could rise again after he was dead and then send his spirit and actually penetrate in your spirit and say, I'm going to live in you. See, now, I'll be honest with you. Church and human tradition and all the religious stuff that many of us grew up with, that is not spiritual. But Christ in you is. And you guys, it's the hope of glory. So what do you want? See, can you imagine the Jesus that all of us look at and we go, man, whether you believe in him or not, most people will go, he was awesome. Can you imagine the Jesus who was so full of beauty and so full of strength and so full of power and so able to forgive and to love everybody? Jesus Christ who knew his purpose. Jesus Christ who literally changed 
the world living in you. You guys, that's what Easter's all about. And I just want to share with you right now, what does that mean? And what could that mean for your life? And what could it mean for my life? See, because in, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul has this prayer. He says this, starting with verse 17. He goes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. And man, I want you to know him better too. And I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. You guys, and what's the hope? The hope is that you could live a glorious life. And he wants you to know this hope. Not just dream about it, actually know it. And the, inherit, the glorious inheritance in the saints. And then look at this. And he goes, and I pray that you would also know his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Okay. This right here, this right here is what following Christ is all about. There is incomparably great power for us who believe, and it is the same power that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. See, this is when you sit there and you go, man, what do you want? What are you looking for? What type of life do you want to live? And God, I don't care how much you dream, God's coming up and saying, no matter what you come up with, I've got something so much more. It's incomparably great power for every person who believes. In Romans 8, 11, he put it this way. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is living in you. See, now again, if you're not a follower of Christ, if you don't buy all this, the one thing you got to say is, did he rise from the dead? Because I'm telling you what, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, even Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, he goes, man, we should just pack up our bags and just go home. Our, our faith is useless if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. But what do you do, again, with a man where hundreds of people would testify and say, I saw him alive after he died? If that's true, then what the Bible is saying is that same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead you can receive that spirit and he will begin to make your life glorious. He will begin to make your life like his. All the joy, all the peace, all the compassion, all the love, all the strength, everything that Christ was. Easter is about him saying, I want to create that inside of you. And that supernatural power is for who? It's for those who believe, for anybody who believes. Now, so here's the issue. You know what it means to believe? See, we have this really skewed notion of what it is to believe based on our education system, right? Because it basically, and when you went to school, all you had to do was spit back information, right, and get it on a, right on a test, and then you'd get an A, okay? I don't know about you guys. Anybody really good at spitting back information and getting A's, you know? I actually graduated from college with a, with a 349, which is, I missed it by uh, honors by one one hundredth. But that's pretty good, right? 349. See, I graduated from college with a 349, and I knew nothing. <laughs> How many of you can relate to that? Uh, look at that. Wait, 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 wait. Raise your hands again if you can relate to that. Everybody look around. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, now, you know why? Because what I would do is I would literally walk to class with my notes. Anybody else do this, right? And you sit down and just hold them until the teacher would say, okay, put your notes away. Put them away, get the test, and then just take all this and just and stick it back on. And then I get the A, and everybody thinks I know something, except me. I know I don't know anything. <laughs> and here's the problem with almost, well, not, not almost all, but here's the problem with the majority of Christians. Because some of you right now are sitting here, and you're saying, man, I've been in church all my life. I went to Sunday school. I've been going through this boring thing forever, and it doesn't do anything. I'm not experiencing any, any incomparably great power. I, I, I'm, I'm actually falling apart inside. 
And so you know why that is? Because it really doesn't matter if you can spout back who the 12 apostles were or what the Ten Commandments were. Or you, know, you, can, you, know, you can actually read the Bible and know, all, I even know people who know the Bible inside and out and they're complete jerks. Anybody else know people like that? Okay, so apparently reading the Bible doesn't even do it. So what does it? You know what it does? It's not that you know it in your head, which is important, but it's taking what you know and believing it. See, the word believe means faith. Pistis, the Greek word, is always translated believe or faith. See, and if you have faith in something, what does that mean? It means you trust it. You trust it. Christian got up here two weeks ago and said, man, I believed in Jesus. I believed he was the son of God. I believe he was the savior. But what had, what had Christian never done? He had never trusted God to go to the depth of his being. See, right now, there's a ton of you Christians and you're 75% of you sitting in this room and you believe that Jesus is the risen God. You're celebrating Easter today and you're sitting there and saying, and I got no power and this stinks. And I'm here to tell you today, it is not supposed to be that way. We have incomparably great power for any person who believes. And just remember, you can be a Christian and be a non-believer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't, I do. I know what it is, what it is to know this in here, but not here. Kind of like, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I don't experience it any day, but I believe it anyway, right? I mean, he's like... <clears throat> and so, what, what we, but that, that song, it's like, okay, I believe it because the Bible tells me so, but I've never experienced it. Wasn't that Christian's message two weeks ago? And what God is saying is, I'm going to tell you something right now. The truth is, you don't know anything until you experience it. That's when you know it is when it actually penetrates your life. And here's the deal. Listen, Christians. And if you're non-Christian, listen to this, because it's going to be true once you find them. Um, you will never experience the power and the love that God has for you that's ours in Christ until you trust him. Really. Until you take a step of faith and I, even as we go through the last part of this message, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to, to maybe God will speak to your heart and help you to know where it is that you're not trusting him, okay? So now I just want to share real quickly, what does this power do? What does this incomparably great power do? What does Jesus Christ alive today do in your heart? Okay? Yes, it does transform it, and here's how. Ephesians chapter 3, verses up on the screen. The first thing that God's power does in Christ is it, is it saves your soul. It saves your soul. Verse, chapter 3, verse 16, Paul's still praying. And he goes, man, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. There it is. Incomparably great power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So the very first thing that God says, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and that same power that rose him from the dead is available to come into you. And what's that power going to do? It's going to strengthen you in your inner being. So what's your inner being? Anybody? What's your inner being? I'm sorry? I'm, I'm so sorry. It's every, okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's your heart. It's your soul. It's where your will reside. The Bible says that, that, that your heart is the wellspring of life. Your inner being, you guys, is everything that drives you to make you who you are, right? It's the culmination of your thoughts and your emotions and your will that rises up inside of you and it drives you. And right now, some of you in your inner being are really, really weak. And you know that you are not living, even close to living, the full life that Jesus Christ... God said, I have, Jesus said, I came so you could have life to the full. And you look in the mirror every day and you go, man, it just ain't happening. And you know that your inner being is weak. And it's weak because you're afraid. You live with fears. I live. See, this is me. I realize, man, when I'm weak, you guys, in my spirit, I hesitate. I avoid stuff. 
I, I, I try to skip around it. And next thing you know, no, you know what I realized this last week is I want to live, man. I want all my relationships that I'm in to be impactful and life-changing. But when I'm weak inside, they aren't. I mean, Susie knows it. She can tell. She can tell automatically when I'm weak. My kids, man, I'm telling you, when, when, when I'm weak in my spirit, I don't fully engage as a dad. And then you know what I do? I'm, I'm a dad who does one of those things where it's like, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm bringing home the bacon and I'm making sure you got a home to live in and, uh, you know, and I'm a nice guy. I'm telling you, kids need a dad who engages in their life. But when my spirit is weak, I don't engage. And, and I don't want to be like that anymore. Some of you guys know that. Some of you, in your inner being, it's not just weak, it's actually broken. I've been so made aware recently. I, I just, I've wept a ton the last few weeks at the reality of some of your situations, even in this room. The, the abuse that takes place in our world is so wrong. And some of your spirits are so broken inside. And you're trying with everything within your own power. Listen, you guys know this. Some of you are trying within your own power to live. And yet your spirit's broken. Your heart is broken. And what Easter tells you is that Jesus is alive to strengthen you with power, incomparably great power in your inner being that's broken. Now, on the flip side of that, some of the things, that some of you in here, you're actually, your drive, you got a drive too, and it's an overdrive. And you're trying every day to prove who you are, and you've, you're the macho guy, and you accomplish everything, and everything's about how much you have and what you do and the position you hold. And man, the worst thing that could ever happen is that everything that you've built up would fall down like a house of cards. And so you have to live with fear even of that. And God wants to come in and say, dude, I want income. I'm going to bring my power in. I'm going to set you free from this drive to have to perform, to have to succeed, to have to be perfect, to have to be the best. And some of you, in your inner being, you don't even get your inner being. You literally look in the mirror and you go, I am not even close to the person I want to be. How in the world did my heart steer me way over and get me in here? I don't even want this. And you can't help it. And God is the one who says, okay, listen, I am alive. And if you'd let me in, I can, first of all, strengthen your weakness. I can mend your brokenness. I can relax your drivenness. And I can get this back on course so that you can be the person you were created to be. And I'm telling you, God knows who he created you to be. And Easter is your greatest hope. It's the hope of glory that you could live a glorious life because the very life of Christ promises to come into your being and begin to create within you who you were made to be. He wants to save your soul and strengthen you with that power. That's the first thing. The second thing he wants to save you guys is your relationships. He wants to save your relationships. It's the power of love. Ephesians 3, 17, he goes on to say, I, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power. Here it is again. You need power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. So you guys, God's love for you is so amazing. And it's so, everything we just talked about earlier in the service today. And it's so amazing that literally what the Bible says is you need power to even be able to grasp it. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that amazing? He, what he, again, what he's saying is, it's not this kind of knowledge, it's knowing it deeply and personally. And the love of Christ, again, comes to every single one of you and says, I know you, and I absolutely love you. It's pure, it's holy, it's perfect, it so accepts you for who you are. But then here's the other thing about God's love, is it's absolutely unrelenting. 
You know what I mean by that? Here's why you need power to grasp God's love. Because once you let him in, the one thing he's going to do is he's going to go into all the funkiness of your heart. And he's going to start to bring it to light. And he's going to go, hey, 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 this stuff you're doing, no more. See, and that's when all of a sudden we go, hey, you know, God, chill out a little bit. You know, hey, I'm just human. You know, I know, and your humanity is screwing up the world. So let's work on this, okay? So he comes in, and he starts to show you what's not good within your own heart. And that's where we slam the door in his face. And you have to believe, no, he's actually loving you. See, now, if you're a parent, you know this love. Because when you're a parent, you look at your kids, and you see stuff they're doing that's totally going to screw up their life. And if you love your kids, you don't go, hey, good luck with that. You know? (laughs) Let's see how much you get screwed up and then I'll pay all your bills for counseling later. No, real love from a parent jumps in to the mess so that they can, and and God's the same way, you guys. And then this is where you really need power to grasp his love. Is he doesn't just want to go in and show you where your heart is skewed. He also wants to go in and show you where your heart is is dying. And this is the hardest, been the hardest thing for me with Jesus is he knows everything within me that hurts. And see, when stuff has been done to you and it hurts and it's really, for some of you, it's so shameful You literally, and this is what Christian shared two weeks ago, you take it and you cram it down because you just don't want to deal with it anymore because it hurts too much to even think about it. You guys do that, right, when people come over to your house? You guys all have the room you throw everything behind? You know? Okay, and you lock up the door and say, hey, you can go anywhere but not there, right? See, what Jesus is like is he comes in your house, he goes, he goes, man, I smell something. He goes, I think it's coming from there. And what he does is he goes right in to that place. I forgot to mention this. In the other verse, when it says that Christ, when he, when he wants to strengthen you with power in your inner being, it says, so that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith. So you guys, you know what the word is? I don't know if I really like the word dwell. You know what the word really means? It means literally he's going to take up residence, permanent residence in your heart. I was sitting there thinking about this message, looking at my house and go, man, can you imagine if Jesus lived in my house? See, that's when it hit me. It's like, the house would be clean. So, right? <clears throat> my kids would all be, I mean, I just imagined the presence of God in my house. It would change everything. And what he's saying is, I'm going to come into your heart. And here's what you guys need to know. He's going to go into the closet where you're hiding all your pain. And here's what you need to know. Your woundedness and your brokenness is driving your life in directions you don't want it to go. It's keeping you fearful so that you don't take the risks to be the person you've ever been created to be. And there's one thing I know about Jesus is he wants you to be whole. And he wants you to be healed. He wants you to be free. And that means he will go right into the deepest, darkest parts of your life. And when he does, it hurts like hell. Literally. And you're going to need power to grasp that this is the love of God. Because on the other side of that is the life you were created to live. And you know what else is cool, you guys? Is once you actually start to be loved by God, once you've exposed all your crap to him, and the holy God of the universe says, I love you. When you know you're loved, you know what you can finally do? You can start loving. You can start loving. And this is when it gets good. That's why the verse said, I pray that you'd have power to grasp along with all of the saints, this love of God. Because you know what happens? 
If I come into this place, K2, this is my dream for K2. We got a long way to go. But my dream for K2 would be that every time I would drive onto this campus, that I would have been so loved by God all week long that I couldn't wait to get here to love on you. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool if you could drive to church and not wonder if anybody's going to love you? But if you could drive to church and say, God, I can't wait to love. See, now, if I was doing that and you were doing that, then you know what would happen? We'd get here and what would happen? You'd get loved. Yeah, it'd be a love fest. Man, it'd be a love feast. People around Salt Lake would be going, what's going on at K2, man? It's weird there. <laughs> Dude's like everybody like loves each other. I mean, it would be unbelievable, you guys. And what God is saying is the church is the body of Christ. It should be a body full of people who finally have grasped the power of his love and who aren't trying to perform for it, who aren't trying to put on the happy face anymore, who are just honest about who they are because Jesus knows who you are and he loves it. And he's changing you, and he's cleaning you up, and he's cleaning me up, and he's cleaning you up. And if there's anybody in here who doesn't think you need cleaning up, you got more cleaning up to do than anybody else. <laughs> and so instead of going to church and saying, I can't be me because people will judge me there, we go, no, church is the one place where they finally know they're a bunch of screwed up people loved by a great God. And then everything would change. Man, that's my dream for this place. Okay, thanks for clapping. <laughs> no, here's why. Here's why. I'm going to hold you to that. I don't know why I'm doing this today, but I'm going to do it. I want to hold you to that. Because your applause says what? You agree. What else does it say? You, you want it. And Easter says what? You've got it. So what's up with us? You know what that's up with us? Simple. We don't believe it. You still don't believe it. I don't, I, 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 we don't believe it. So I want to encourage you, man, get this stuff out and let God start to touch your crap. And you'll finally realize there is nothing that I can do that'll keep God from loving me. And once you've got that, that's why I tell you guys all the time, my life is one big pile of mercy. And once you know it is, then that's all you can give each other. And let's start giving it to each other. This place will rock. People will flock to be here. You know why? Because every human heart needs to know they're loved. Not the mask that they're wearing. The real person needs it. And nobody should be able to offer that more than people who've experienced the love of Christ. Okay, so here's the last one. God wants to save the world. This is a great verse. Paul ends it with this. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power. There it is again. At work within us. To him be glory in the church. Wouldn't that be great? To him be glory in the church. What's the glory? It's Christ in us. People filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control and power and strength and compassion. To Christ be glory in the church. Glory in K2 throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now throw it back up in verse 20. So you guys, here's the deal. I just want to ask you, what do you want your life to be about? Here's what's true what God says about every single one of us in this room. He goes, if you let me in your life, I am going to do more with you than you could ever dream. See, I know this verse. Because, man, I'm the, I'm, all, I, I, all the time I sit there and I look at my life and I go, how in the world did I end up here? This little dude, you know, that grew up in Lapeer, Michigan, out in the country, playing with football cards. How did this guy end up doing what I'm doing now, and there's only one reason. Because Jesus Christ, when I said, here I am, have me, and I gave him my life, he had a whole other plan for me that I would have never planned. Nobody wants to be a pastor. <laughs> you know, did you ever hear that in fourth grade? What do you want to be when you grow up, a pastor? <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. But when you give your life to Christ, he says, you find your life. And then he does more with you than you could have ever asked or imagined. I'm the one who said, I will never plant a church. After seeing what it took to plant the one in, in Detroit, I'm like, dude, somebody else can have that job. 
But then you give your life to him, and he says, by, by the way, never tell God you won't do something, okay? <laughs> if you ever say, I'll never, just pack your bags and get ready to go, okay? <laughs> because God will do more in you. And here, here's my question, you guys. What kind of life you want to live? What kind of life you want to live? You want to live a nice, little, safe, human existence? Or do you want to live a life filled with the power of the risen Christ? One guy changed the world. And now he says, I'm in you, and in you, and in you, and in you, and in you. What could K2 be if we were people filled with the Spirit of God? We would change the world. And I'm just telling you, this is where I just sit there and I go, I personally am not very interested in just being a part of an American church that just does an hour and a half you know, on Sundays and goes home and goes, okay, maybe I'll show up next week. Ah! <laughs> no! But I'm very interested in knowing the risen Christ with you and uniting together to change the world and to have his power do more than you could ever ask or imagine. So how does this work? Here's how it works. If anyone believes, then Jesus says, then you're going to receive me. And he says, and if you receive me, I'm going in. And I'm going to go in to all of your life. I'm going to heal your wounds. I'm going to strengthen your heart. I'm going to reveal to you who you are. I'm going to do more than you than you could ever imagine. See, what he says is what, what's going to happen is you're going to get baptized what he says. See, because the word baptize literally means to dip. We're going to celebrate this here in a minute. It literally means to dip. So a person would take a piece of cloth and they dip it into dye. And then when they pull it out, the dye had infused every fiber of that cloth and it was completely different. And what God, what the Bible tells us is that Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. See, this is very spiritual. What that means is, is when you receive, when you believe, when you finally say, I'm going to trust you, Jesus then he says literally, spiritually, I go in to every fiber of your being. And I begin to make you the man or the woman that you were created to be. Now imagine with me the risen Christ in your life. As we celebrate these baptisms, you guys, just, just watch, and it's so cool. We got some kids who, were, who got baptized. I'm telling you, my 10-year-old my daughter freaks me out. I'm telling you this, you can know Jesus as a kid. You can really know him. And so celebrate even with these, with these kids as they tell you, I accepted Christ. But listen to these stories and imagine your story. Imagine your life being infused by the risen Christ in all of his beauty and his strength and his power to make you who you're meant to be. And let's watch this together. My name is Alan Rigby. I am new here at K2. I've been coming here since November of last year. I, I was in a dangerous area, uh, actually worshiping Satan at one time, just downright Satan worship. Things weren't working out very well. I was in a dark place. It was a frightening time for me. Um, I was on my way downtown and I would see the, the K2 church here. And I was wondering, what is that about? What does K2 mean? And I thought, well, maybe that would be a good place to start. And I came here, um, my first service here, listening to the pastor speaking, it just hit home completely. I was just flooded with maybe a new light. I felt like this was going to be my new home. And I ended up that night giving my life to Christ. I didn't really have to think too much about it because I felt like this is, this is it. You know, this is, this is what it is. This is, Jesus is true. What he said is true. I believe that he was, he was killed for my sins and that he rose again. And I want, an, I want more. I want to get all I can get. My name's Keaton Pike. I've been going to K2 for three and a half years. My neighbor came over and he was always bugging my dad about coming to K2 and then we tried it one time for the Christmas service 
and we've just been coming ever since. My dad got baptized last year and I thought that was a really great example for me. So I said, I wanna tell people that I know that I am a follower of Christ and I want to do it. So he said, okay, we can get you signed up and you can go ahead and get baptized. I had my dad, Mike Pike, uh, help baptize me and I wanted him to do it because he's helped me follow Christ, get to know him better. I walked out of that pool a happy new person. I'm Lily, I'm eight years old. The reason that I wanted to get baptized is because I wanted to show other people that I believe in God. Hi, I'm Nandy, and I'm 10 years old. I want to be baptized because um, I want God to heal my sins. 24 oceans. Hi, my name is Nick, and I've been going to K2 for several years now, and I serve on the arts team, and I do um, sound on Sunday mornings. My favorite part of, of being at K2 is just um, the community and the experience I get. Um, I have opportunities here, which I don't get in a lot of other places. Well, a lot of people that I've met um, get the impression that I'm not a normal person, and that's correct, I'm not a normal person. I am autistic. I have this condition called Asperger's Syndrome, and I've had that all my life. And because of this condition, I'm really accustomed to being treated by other people like I'm invisible. A lot of people say that um, they're all accepting and tolerant of other people until they actually have to be with someone who's different from them and then all that acceptance and tolerance goes out the door. I've received more death threats in my life than I've been kissed, but I'm not telling you that because I want your pity. I don't want your pity. I, I used to be really depressed about how I was hated so harshly by so many people in the past, but then I was invited to this church and Dave and Christian and Ladd and everyone else who has been on the stage, they really told it like it is. Um, they made me feel better because they said that everybody is broken and messed up and we all have our stuff and nobody's perfect. And it's through them and through reading the Bible that I discovered that there is a God out there and that God loves us even though we make mistakes and we're not perfect. He loves us for who we are and he didn't make mistakes when he made any of us. And now, I just want to share God's love with everybody else. That I've been happy. I used to be depressed all the time because of my condition in life. And since then, I've realized that I'm not alone in this world and that I am loved by a higher power. And for that, I really am happy. I want to thank all the people at K2, the church, for accepting me as a disciple of Jesus because it's so rare that I get that kind of acceptance and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Matthew, I'm eight years old and I love to do sports, soccer, football, and pretty much any sport. I want to get baptized because Jesus died for, for us on the cross and he rose again. And I really think that that was amazing. I wanted to be a follower of Jesus and a son of God. Hi, I'm Natalie Rutledge. I'm 10 years old and I'm in fifth grade at Longview Elementary. God was just something out there in the open that I could choose to accept into my heart or I could choose not to. And whenever I got offered to ask God into my heart, I did it just because everyone else was doing it. But as I got older, my relationship with God got closer and closer. And I realized that the only thing tying me down was me and that I needed to accept God into my heart. Thank you, K2, for being an encouragement to me. And thank you, pastors, for really pursuing God.
Hey, I'm Brittany Lee. I've been coming to K2 for about two years now, and I serve on the arts team with the band. I was invited, um, the guy I was dating at the time, he was invited to come see the band play at K2. The music brought me in that day, but something else kept me here. I kept coming back every week, just, just waiting for the day that they would tell me something to make me want to walk back out the door. So after coming to K2 for about a year, I was sitting in the congregation and something changed. I felt something different. Um, because for so long I felt that whoever, whoever Jesus was or whoever, whoever I was praying to or believing in, I just felt like I was alone. And sitting in the congregation that day, I received the answer that I've been pretty much asking for. Why did God turn his back on me? Like, why did he leave? I heard that day I never left. Um, I've been here the whole time, and, and now I'm glad you're back. When I found it's not grace, and then I found it for myself, I realized that I had been missing the mark, but missing the mark on the, on the miracle. That he, would, that he would die for me. Oh